Okay, well, thanks for um, joining me today. This uh, second Sunday in uh, the month of May, and uh, hard to believe we're almost one third of the way through the month, but uh, tomorrow is the 10th, and uh, there's 31 days in this month, and uh, we have five Sundays in the month of May. So um, this is our second of five lessons as we're finishing up um, the study of the Gospel of Luke. And from the Lord's Supper through last week in the Garden of uh, Gethsemane, we've been traveling with Jesus as he entered into his uh, final 24 hours of life on earth pre-resurrection. Um, you know, we've got two more lessons left on the way to the cross. Uh, and today we're picking up uh, in Luke where we left off last week after Jesus was arrested in the garden. Um, you'll recall there were uh, two disciples that played a really key role uh, last week in the lesson. First, there was Judas, um, of course, who Jesus had already pegged as his betrayer um, during the final Passover meal in the upper room. And as uh, Jesus had finished praying, you'll remember how Judas came on the scene last week and he was accompanied by an armed mob. We know that there were some of the Jewish religious leaders that were a part of that group. We know that there were temple guards that were part of that group. We know that there were some servants of the high priest that were part of that group. Um, and as the mob sort of formed there in the garden, um, Judas came forward to kiss Jesus. And um, we know that this was a prearranged signal that Judas had given to the mob. You know, whoever I kiss, that is the person that you are um, to arrest. But as he came forward to kiss Jesus, we find um, the savior of the world asking his traitorous disciple if he was really going to betray the son of man with a kiss. And the question really had to shake Judas to his core. Um, but listen, he wasn't the only one that was shaken by what was going on at that time, because you'll remember Peter, and he was the other disciple that was in the spotlight, um, and he also found himself rebu rebuked by Jesus, but for a different reason, and so you'll remember that um, as they went to take custody of Jesus, that Peter impulsively drew out his sword, and he, and he struck the high priest servant named Malchus, um, and cut off his ear. And Jesus was very, very angry at Peter for what he did. And Jesus just said sternly, no more of this, you'll remember. And with that, he miraculously touched Malchus's ear and he healed him. Now, after this happening, you would think that Peter, who was so quick to come to his master's defense, even with a weapon, that he would continue to fiercely stand by um, Jesus. And if you thought this, as you're going to see, you would be terribly wrong. Because we're going to see in today's lesson titled Denied, um, that there are consequences whenever a person turns their back on the Lord Jesus, who never turns his back on anyone. And our text is going to be drawn from the 22nd chapter of Luke. And we're going to be looking at verses 54 through 62. But before we do that, um, before we um, come to um, our scripture passages for today, um, let's have a word of prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you are our faithful Savior, the one who cares for us now and will care for us for all eternity. There isn't a time that you aren't with us. There's never a time that you aren't prepared to listen to and ready to respond to our prayers. And you give us your strength so that we can endure and do all things. You fully invest yourself in us, Lord Jesus. But sadly, we don't always return the favor. We confess that we allow the things of this world to steal away our attention from you. And we even may behave around certain people as if we have no association with you. So forgive us, Lord Jesus, when we have failed to be as faithful to you as you are to us. And help us see today the consequences of abandoning you when times get hard, even though you never abandon us. We ask now that you would open our 
hearts and our minds, Lord Jesus, to the study of this gospel message. And we ask that you would transform us so that we might be more the kind of people, the kind of disciples that you want us to be. Well, we pray today and always in your precious name, the name above every name, the name of Jesus, the only name by which anyone can be saved. Amen. You know, Jesus had told his disciples and us uh, this during his ministry. He said this, and this is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 33. He said, whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. You know, perhaps there could be no more stern warning or greater penalty given to someone by our Savior. But think about how important it is for Jesus to step forward as we will go before God one day to face judgment for our sin. And we need him to go forward, right, to let his Father know that he had purchased our pardon and that he had sealed our salvation through his shed blood. You know, we would be hopeless standing before God without being acknowledged and justified by Jesus, our Savior. And this is why denying Jesus is the ultimate bad idea, as it has both present and future implications. It also will lead a person, um, the person who denies him, to extreme sorrow and guilt, as we're going to see in the person of Peter, who must have forgotten Jesus's warning while under intense scrutiny and pressure for being associated with his Savior. So we're going to get started by looking at the 22nd chapter of Luke's gospel, and um, specifically we're looking at verses 54 through 57 as we get started. So starting at verse 54, it says, and they seized him talking about Jesus and led him away and brought him into the high priest's house. Meanwhile, Peter was following at a distance. Well, they lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, and Peter sat among them. And when a servant saw him sitting in the light and looked closely at him, she said, this man was with him too. But he, Peter, denied it, saying, woman, I don't know him. You know, after Jesus had healed Malchus's ear, he offered no resistance to his arresters who seized him and led him away to the high priest's house. You'll remember that Jesus even challenged those who had come, the mob, saying, you know, I had preached in your synagogues. I, you know, you had plenty of opportunity, you know, to seize me. Why, you know, why are you waiting until now? And, you know, why do you come armed as if I'm, you know, some kind of criminal? So he offered up no resistance. Remember, he had prayed in the garden that, you know, if this cup would be taken from me, Father, um, then great, but, you know, thy will be done. He was willing to submit to his father's will, and he knew his father's will um, involved him going to the cross and suffering and dying and shedding his blood um, to pay the price for the sins of all mankind. Well, as Jesus was led to the high priest's home, um, this home had many rooms and it also had a large courtyard, uh, and it had a protective wall that was built around it. And at the time of Jesus's arrest, this home belonged to a man named Caiaphas, who was the high priest of that year. Now, the scriptures tell us that Peter followed the mob at a distance as they went to Caiaphas's home. The Gospel of John tells us that Peter was not alone that uh, John was traveling with him, and, and John was known to Caiaphas, and in John's gospel, we hear about John being invited in, actually, to where Jesus was being put on trial, while Peter had to remain outside. So there must have been quite a chill in the air. We know it was the early morning hours of Friday. And we know that this was the day of Jesus's eventual crucifixion. And we read that the temple guards and others who had 
taken Jesus captive. They built a fire in the courtyard and they sat around it to warn themselves. And the scriptures tell us that um, Peter, well, he was in their company. Now, one could question the sensibility here of Peter's decision because, listen, Peter hadn't exactly kept a low profile in Gethsemane's garden. I mean, everybody had gotten a good look at him when he brought out his sword and cut off Malchus's ear. And as long as Peter stayed in sort of the recesses of the dark, he could go unnoticed. But here he comes and sits at the fire with the rest of the people who had arrested Jesus. And as he sat there by the fire, he was identified by one of the high priest servant girls who stated, this man was with him too. And imagine how the gaze of everyone around that fire had to turn toward Peter. It would have been just like, you know, like they're all looking at Peter and staring him down. Um, and so he was definitely not incognito anymore. And he needed to come up with a response and he needed to come up with it quick. So we find Peter blurting out, woman, I don't know him. And this was Peter's first strike. And it really was an incredibly disappointing moment. For if you remember, Jesus had referred to Peter as his rock and the one that he wanted to build his church upon. We'll talk more about this a little bit later. But this does raise the question, how could Jesus ever build his Christian church on this man who was denying now that he even knew him? And further, how could Jesus ever do anything through Peter or anyone else who would deny knowing him? Well, perhaps there could be um, few greater transgressions than denying that you don't even know Jesus, especially if you are proclaiming yourself as a disciple. And this is especially true since he never really stops revealing himself to anybody. I mean, really, nobody can say that they don't know Jesus, that they don't know our Lord. Well, as we're going to see in our next passage, Peter's denial, well, it wasn't just a one and done matter. Um, for a chance to redeem himself and right his wrongs was coming fast, and we'll see how he handles that. We're going to look at um, verse 58 now in our passage, Luke 22, verse 58. One simple verse. It says, after a little while, someone else saw him talking about Peter and said, you're one of them too. Man, I am not, Peter said. You know, so for a short time, Peter got away with his denial. I mean, he wasn't immediately challenged anymore. Um, people took him at his word. Okay, um, must have been somebody else that I saw, right? So this uh, scripture verse starts out saying, after a little while. So a little time had passed. And um, you know, one of the other excerpts here is we are reading um, all the gospels, if you look at them. Um, you know, Peter left the fire in Matthew's gospel, if you go there, says that he went on to the porch of Caiaphas's home, and he positioned himself there. And while he was there, he found himself once again being identified as someone who was with Jesus. And the man said, you're one of them too. And with the them, um, he was really alluding to Peter being one of Jesus's disciples. And again, we find Peter denying his association with Jesus by saying, I am not. It was strike two. So would Peter get a third chance? That's the question. Let's look at verses 59 and 60, the first part of 60. It says about an hour later then, another kept insisting, this man was certainly with him since he's also a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I don't know what you're talking about. Now, an hour had passed. I mean, this was quite some time from the second challenge and after Peter's second denial. And while Jesus was being interrogated inside of Caiaphas's home, Peter was being challenged on the outside 
this time by a man who used Peter's homeland, Galilee, to tie him to Jesus, who was clearly a Galilean because we know his hometown was Nazareth. Well, the scriptures don't necessarily tell us how the man ID'd Peter as a Galilean, but it is thought that it was from the words that Peter spoke. You know, such words would reveal accents that were specific to a particular region, much like a, a New Yorker might say New York, you know, or forget about it, you know, or you could hear somebody from New England saying, I'm going to park my car in Boston Yard, you know, or even, you know, somebody with a British accent, you know, speaking, you know, we can identify and say, you know, you're not from around here, are you? Um, here in Virginia, it may be um, a Southern accent. Um, so nice to see you, y'all. So we can really identify, you know, people through their accents. And it's thought that Peter's accent was one of somebody that would be from the region of Galilee. And the Simeon pegs him as a Galilean. So Peter now faced a third chance, a third chance to do the right thing and to associate himself with Jesus. Unfortunately, though, as with the first two opportunities, we find that he failed miserably. For in the first half of verse 60, Peter boldly proclaims, man, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, the danger level had really risen for Peter at this point because the man asserting Peter was with Jesus was none other than Malchus's brother. And we learned this in the Gospel of John. Malchus's brother was there in the garden, and he would have been very focused on who cut off the ear of his brother. He knew that it was Peter. And Mark's Gospel tells us that at that point, um, Peter um, rained down curses upon himself, and he swore with an oath as he responded that he didn't know Jesus. It was strike three. Well, Peter didn't get many other words out before a particular event happened, one that would jar Peter's memory with words that Jesus spoke to him, words that now were coming to life. So we're going to look at the second half of uh, verse 60, and we're going to read through to the end of our passage today, which is verse 62. So this is Luke 22 starting in verse 60b, the second part of verse 60 through 62. Immediately while he, Peter, was still speaking, a rooster crowed. And then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. So Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he, Peter, he went outside and he wept bitterly. You know, when you look back and you think about the relationship that Jesus had with Peter, it was quite a relationship if you think about it. It was almost like a father-son relationship as, you know, the son was growing up into adulthood. I mean, fathers will admit, and today is Mother's Day, so of course we can't forget the moms. Moms could profess to this as well, that there are times when you're proud of your son, proud of your child, and there are times when you also were disappointed in them when they were growing up. So imagine the joy that Jesus must have felt as he was walking on the water toward the boat where Peter was with the rest of the disciples. And in faith, Peter steps out on the water and starts to walk toward Jesus. Imagine the joy that Jesus must have felt at that time about the faith of his disciple. And then imagine the disappointment that must have struck Jesus as the wind started to blow around Peter and he started to doubt and what happened? He started to sink into the water and Jesus had to reach down and rescue Peter from drowning before asking him why he doubted. 
And then there was the time when Jesus asked Peter who he believed his master was, wanting to know how Peter saw his, Jesus's identity. And we sense the pride that Jesus felt after Peter tells him, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You know, Jesus was so pleased with Peter's reply that he tells his disciples that he, Peter, would be the rock that Jesus would build his church on. You know, Jesus told Peter that he would give him the keys of heaven before he shifted attention to himself and then told all 12 of the disciples how he would have to suffer and then be killed and then be raised back to life on the third day. Well, the second part of that message by Jesus, it was too much for Peter to comprehend. And to him, it was unbelievable what Jesus was saying would happen. So much so that the scriptures say that Peter decides to rebuke Jesus, saying, never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Which in turn led Jesus to say to Peter, get behind me, Satan, you are a stumbling block to me. Finally, right after the Passover meal, Jesus tells Peter that he had prayed for him, and Jesus had prayed that Peter's faith would not fail. And as Jesus tells him this, Peter makes a proclamation. He says, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. And this led Jesus to predict the following as he told Peter, and we have we covered this already, I tell you, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. Well, you know, those words of prophecy had to be on the hearts of both Jesus and Peter at that very moment when the rooster crowed in the vicinity of the high priest's home. And we read where Jesus turns and he looks right at Peter. Imagine that. Imagine you're Peter and the rooster just crowed and you have denied your Savior three times and you know that Jesus had told you that it would happen. I mean, the gaze that Jesus placed on Peter had to burn a hole right through his heart as he remembered what Jesus had said. And at that moment, to these two hearts, they felt brokenness, the master and his pupil, the father and his beloved son, disciple, who was growing and trying to grow into spiritual maturity. You know, Peter was so filled with shame and sorrow that he fled the scene. And the scriptures tell us in verse 62 that he wept bitterly. He was unable to contain the deep sadness that he felt as he had failed to stand by Jesus at his time of deepest need. And so all this really leads to a major point behind this lesson today. For making the choice to be a disciple of Jesus, it requires that the person making the decision counts the cost. For Jesus warned that anyone who would follow him could expect to be hated because he had been hated. Jesus made sure his disciples knew that they would experience persecution and suffering and maybe even be put to death for their belief in him. And indeed, we see this happening today in many parts of our world. It's not an easy road to travel when one decides to become a Christian. And we will be challenged because of our beliefs, sometimes by those who are even closest to us within our families. <clears throat> I know that's happening to me. So the question is, will we be strong in the midst of adversity? And will we, unlike Peter, remain true to our Savior, even when we're being challenged? Or will we, like Peter, deny him when the chips are really down? You know, the key here to not repeating the mistakes of Peter 
the key is to stay in constant connection with Jesus in our lives. He promised to be with us until the end of the age. He told us this at the end of his great commission. And God's word assures us that we can do all things through the strength that Christ offers. All things, not just some things. You know, through the power of Jesus and the Holy Spirit that is given to us when we place our belief in him, we can endure any and all hardships, and we can remain faithful and true to him, for he is always that way to us. That's the good news for us today. <clears throat> we don't need to end up like Peter. We can learn from his mistakes, and we can always stay true and stay firm and stay devoted and stay dedicated to our Savior no matter what life brings upon us. Amen. Well, next week, we're going to find ourselves with Jesus at the pinnacle of his suffering <clears throat> as he's crucified at Golgotha, which the scriptures tell us is called the place of the skull. You know, it's amazing because we're going to see that at the cross, Jesus is going to do two amazing acts of and both of them are grounded in amazing forgiveness. So I hope that you'll join me then next week where we're going to see a place of death become one of deep beauty. And we'll all learn what I always call the yardstick of forgiveness as we look at our lesson next week. <clears throat> I pray that all of you will have a blessed week ahead. And I hope to see you as we come together next week and study and in fellowship. God bless all of you.